Kafu. Welcome to the 21st edition of the Teddy Waste Awards. My name is Aaron Woodrick. I'm the Federal Director of the Canadian Taxpayers Federation, and I'll be your host for this morning's ceremony, assisted as always by our friendly mascot, Porky the Waste Hater, and by our lovely presenter, Lindsay. Now, for those not aware, the Teddies are actually not named for a lovable stuffed animal, but in honor of a man named Ted Wetherill, a former federal bureaucrat who managed to rack up $150,000 in food and drink expenses before finally losing his job. Now, Ted may be long gone, but his legacy lives on through our annual uh, awards, which have become his namesake. They're a celebration of the best of the worst of government waste. Because it turns out that politicians, bureaucrats, and taxpayers may experience wasteful spending differently. Now, this year, we have a total of 17 nominations in the federal, provincial, and municipal categories, in addition to our most prestigious award, the Lifetime Achievement Award. We'll start first with the municipal category. The first nominee is TransLink, Metro Vancouver's Transportation Authority, and no stranger to these awards, for spending $1,000 on birth control for pigeons. Aside from the excessive droppings, it seems the birds pose a safety risk to commuters as they can set off automatic sensors that may cause the driverless trains to suddenly break. So a plan was hatched to set up special bird feeders filled with a contraceptive. But there's a prerequisite to this plan to put pigeons on the pill. If they don't take a daily dose, the drugs don't work, leaving taxpayers to cry foul at such a bird-brained idea. The second nominee is the rural municipality of Clayton, Saskatchewan for spending $340,000 on a bridge over the Swan River, which was open to traffic on a September morning last year and worked for approximately nine hours before a section of the bridge collapsed into the river below. Thankfully, no one was injured in this mishap except for municipal taxpayers who are out 300 grand and still have no bridge. The third nominee is the city of Calgary for wasting $10 million on a folly of Olympic proportions, namely a bid to host the 2026 Winter Olympics. It turns out that asking taxpayers in a city with high unemployment to bankroll an expensive sporting event notorious for frequent cost overruns is not a winning proposition, as bid boosters found out when Calgarians voted 56% against proceeding with the bid in a citywide referendum last November. The fourth nominee is the City of Vancouver's Parks Board for leaving taxpayers with the short end of the stick by spending $50,000 encouraging people to send emails to trees. You heard that right, emails to trees. The board's All the Trees project, which ran from August to December of last year, uh, involved putting trees in and around, uh, signs on trees in and around Jericho Beach Park that included a special email address inviting people to send the trees emails. The board then paid five artists $10,000 each to reply to these emails, although apparently they weren't being kept very busy. When the CTF sent one of the trees an email last September, the reply from the tree noted that it was actually the first email they'd received. And the final municipal nominee is the town of Vulcan, Alberta, which spent $4,000 on Star Trek uniforms for its mayor and town councillors. The town, which has the same name as the iconic homeworld of Star Trek Spock, has become something of a niche tourism destination for fans of the sci-fi series, although residents could be forgiven for thinking that blowing four grand on Star Trek uniforms is most illogical. And with that, I'd ask Lindsay for the municipal envelope, please. Thank you very much. And the winner... It's Vancouver's Parks Board. Vancouver's Parks Board wins the Municipal Award. Hopefully they recognize the root problem and, uh, and turn over a new leaf. We'll move on now to the provincial nominees. The first nominee is the Government of Manitoba for feathering Canada, Goose, Canada Goose's Nest with $1.4 million in taxpayer handouts. The highly successful luxury coat company, which has a market cap of $8 billion, will be comfortably insulated from having to pay to train some of its own Winnipeg-based employees, while Manitoba taxpayers get stuck with the fiscal goose egg. The second nominee is Cannabis New Brunswick, New Brunswick's government-owned marijuana retailer, which created a how-to guide on its website explaining the fine art of how to roll a joint. Under the Cannabis 101 section, the agency notes that rolling is one of the most iconic ways of consuming cannabis and offers such handy tips as advising the cannabis be ground until it has the consistency, but not the smell, of oregano and to distribute the cannabis evenly throughout the joint. In unrelated news, a YouTube search of how to roll a joint returned at least 33 videos with more than a million views each. The third nominee, Craig James and Gary Lentz, the legislature went on a spending spree with taxpayer money so outrageous it took Speaker of the House Daryl Plicka 76 pages to document just one year of crazy examples. Aside from frequent and expensive trips abroad, Plicka alleges James and Lentz built taxpayers for such items as 
a $3,200 wood splitter, which for some reason was stored at James's house, a $700 watch purchased at the Hong Kong airport and worn by James at the very press conference where he protested his innocence, and $1,000 for a whale watching excursion, which was falsely claimed as a tsunami awareness exercise. The fourth nominee is Jacques Chagnon, former speaker of the Quebec National Assembly, who had a taste for fine food and drink, ordering lobster regularly from the Assembly's dining room, even though lobster was not even on the menu, and hosting working afternoon meetings where wine was served liberally, with the bill regularly exceeding $1,000. Chagnon also reportedly had his taxpayer-funded office cover all expenses on various international trips for Quebec politicians of all parties, with repeated requests for more detailed cost breakdowns being refused by Chagnon's office. In an interview following revelations of his lavish spending, Chagnon stated that controlling spending on meals and alcohol, quote, never crossed my mind, and that he has, quote, never been concerned about such issues ever. The fifth nominee is the Government of Ontario for giving $34.5 million in corporate welfare to Maple Leaf Foods to help build a new chicken processing plant in London, in spite of the fact Premier Doug Ford promised to put an end to corporate welfare during last year's election campaign. Worse yet, while politicians were happy to cluck about the new jobs, they neglected to mention that Maple Leaf also planned to close three other plants throughout the province, meaning there would actually be a net loss of 300 jobs, which I think makes the announcement rather less exciting. And the sixth and final nominee is Nova Scotia's Yarmouth Ferry for spending several million dollars a year on a money-losing ferry between the province and the U.S. state of Maine. Having previously stuck Nova Scotia taxpayers with the cost of improvements at the Portland Maine Ferry Terminal, last year it emerged that taxpayers may now be on the hook to pay for U.S. border agents and for upgrades to yet another American ferry terminal, this time in Bahaba. When asked what the total cost to Nova Scotia taxpayers would be, the province's transport minister reassuringly stated, quote, I have no idea. And with that, I'll ask Lindsay for the provincial envelope, please. Thank you very much. And the winner is, well, you can buy me a wood chipper and take me on a whale watching excursion. It's, it's Craig James and Gary Lentz, British Columbia, two for two so far this year. We'll now go to the federal nominees. The first nominee is Global Affairs Canada for dropping 127 grand on crystal glassware at an average cost of $117 per glass, which by the way is twice as much as Tiffany Crystal, as well as $25,000 on 86 seat cushions for the Canadian Embassy in Mexico City. When asked for comment on the pricey pillows, a Global Affairs spokesperson stated that, quote, we know that taxpayers' dollars must be treated with the utmost respect, which really makes you wonder what disrespect would look like. The second nominee, is the Department of National Defense for planning to spend up to $170,000 on special goggles that would allow its senior leaders to experience a simulated version of getting high. According to department officials, the goggles are intended to provide a realistic first-hand experience of what smoking pot feels like, while representatives for the Trailer Park Boys would like to point out there's actually another cheaper option to find out what it's like to smoke weed. The third nominee is Shared Services Canada for spending $18,000 on an office fumigation after a spider scare caused the evacuation of 50 employees for two days on two separate occasions. On the first occasion, the building owner paid to have the building fumigated, but on the second occasion, the suspect spider was caught and sent for identification. But before the results came back, the office was once again fumigated, this time at taxpayer expense. The spider, which was initially feared to be a, brown a poisonous brown recluse, turned out to actually be a harmless yellow sack spider. An arachnologist at the University of Toronto characterized the evacuations as, quote, totally absurd and a giant waste of money, noting that less than five brown recluses had even been recorded in Canada in the last century. The fourth nominees are Finance Minister Bill Morneau and Democratic Institutions Minister Karina Gould for their ill-conceived measure to subsidize journalism while fighting fake news. As part of the 2018 budget, Minister Morno announced $50 million in taxpayer subsidies to support media, apparently without stopping to think whether government picking who gets handouts and who doesn't might possibly undermine confidence in media independence. Then in January, Minister Gould announced $7 million to combat fake news by educating Canadians about the shocking fact that you can't believe everything you read on the internet. Who knew? The fifth nominee is a bipartisan joint nomination of the Harper and Trudeau governments for the ill-fated ill bailout and loan write-off of General Motors and Chrysler. In 2009, the Harper government announced a $14 billion taxpayer bailout of the company's Canadian operations, and in October of last year, the Trudeau government wrote off remaining Chrysler loans with little fanfare, marked as a single line item buried in the public accounts. 
To add insult to injury in November, General Motors announced it would be closing its Oshawa plant, throwing 2,600 people out of work. And the sixth and final federal nominee is Prime Minister Justin Trudeau for his now infamous trip to India, which cost taxpayers at least $1.6 million without providing any obvious value, aside maybe from some handy tips on bhangra dancing. For the eight-day trip last February, the Prime Minister only scheduled a half day of official government-to-government -government business, but did manage to find traditional Indian outfits to wear almost every day of his visit. It emerged that a Canadian man, once convicted of attempting to assassinate an Indian cabinet minister, was actually invited by a Liberal MP to attend one of the PM's events in Mumbai, who even managed to snag a photo with the PM's wife, Sophie. To top it all off, the government spent $17,000 to bring a Vancouver-based celebrity chef to India to prepare an Indian meal at the Canadian High Commission, which makes perfect sense because where could you find somebody in India to make Indian food? And with that, I'd ask for the federal envelope, please. Thank you very much. And the winner is, it's the India trip, of course. Maybe next time, no costumes or a celebrity chef. And always remember to double check your, uh, your guest list. And now, we go to the grand finale, the fourth and final award, the Lifetime Achievement Award. This year, we are doing something we never done before, something, frankly, I don't think we ever thought we would be doing. It takes a special talent for wasting money to earn this kind of precedent-setting recognition. Ladies and gentlemen, the winner of this year's Lifetime Achievement Award, uh, the, the, this year's winner of the Lifetime Achievement Award, Teddy, for the second time, for the second time, it's former Governor General Adrian Clarkson, two Lifetime Achievement Awards. She's already the recipient of the 2004 award for her outrageous, expensive trips while in office. Uh, but Her Excell Excellency wins this for managing somehow to continue soaking taxpayers more than 14 years after leaving office. Now, last year, news broke that Clarkson had billed taxpayers for more than $100,000 per year almost every year since 2005. It's a total of more than $1.1 million under a 40-year-old government policy that allows former governor generals to continue to submit expenses to taxpayers even after they've left office. Only claims over $100,000 have to be disclosed and no details of the expenses are available to the public. In January, the CTF delivered a petition to the Prime Minister signed by more than 46,000 Canadians calling for an end to this outrageous policy. For her part, Madame Clarkson remains defiant, arguing she continues to represent Canada unofficially. But speaking on behalf of 46,000 petition signers and many more, I would say, please retire, Your Excellency. We simply can't afford to pay for your volunteerism. And that concludes the 2019 Teddy Award.